Hey everybody, Chad Wesley Smith here for Juggernaut Train Systems. I'm going to be taking the final installment of our video series on the scientific principles of strength training. Today's principle, individual differences. Individual differences tends to be a little bit of a controversial one because I think it's something that people tend to really overvalue in their training. You notice here we have it as our seventh principle. And the real idea between individual differences and why we give it a lower priority is because all the principles apply to everyone. You can't have a good program without specificity, without overload, without fatigue management. But you can still have a relatively effective program even if you're not tailoring it specifically to the demands of the individual lifter. Now if you want to have the best program, and of course we do, you need to take those and, and understand that people are going to respond to different magnitudes of the different principles. So while overload is important for everyone, some people's MRV is going to dictate how much hypertrophy training they can, they can tolerate, how much volume they can tolerate, how heavy of weights they can tolerate in general strength and peaking, how frequently they need to be training. So today we're going to talk about the different things that you need to consider to make sure that you are tailoring programs to be the most effective for yourself and each athlete that you coach. So we need to consider both inter and intra individual differences. Inter individual differences are going to be differences from person to person. So from athlete to athlete, and largely those are genetic differences. Some people, their muscles are just made of better stuff. They have a higher uh, capacity to recover. They have the ability to hold on to, to fitness longer while decaying fatigue faster. Uh, different fiber types need to be considered, but also lifestyle factors are going to be very important as well. Because even if you were to have, you know, twin brothers, let's say, and one of them stays out partying until 2 o'clock in the morning every day while the other one's going to bed at 9 p.m. and has a, has a great diet, the one who's taking care of their lifestyle factors is going to tend to recover better and they're going to be able to handle more hard training. Uh, also important to consider with the inter-individual differences from person to person is going to be fiber type. And this one tends to be a little bit counterintuitive because fast twitch fibers are going to help an athlete be more successful at powerlifting. You might think that they're better, you know, they're better, they are better suited to the sport, but they're not necessarily going to be better suited to doing more work because fast twitch fibers take longer to recover, uh, tend to be larger than slower twitch fibers. So those fast twitch fiber athletes, while they might be great powerlifters, uh, oftentimes aren't going to be able to tolerate as high a training volumes as their slower twitch counterparts. Now as we look at intra-individual differences, these are differences within the same athlete, uh, either at different points in a training year uh, or at different points in their training career. So as you look at different points in the year, their MRV and, and different factors are going to change based on their lifestyle factors. You know, maybe they're just more serious about their diet at certain times of the year, higher stress or lower stress, depending on work, school, relationships. Uh, different, you know, supplementation levels during the year need to be considered with that. You know, their genetics are going to stay the same all the time, but those lifestyle factors are going to are going to change uh, throughout a training cycle, throughout a throughout a year, throughout their career. A really good analogy to consider these lifestyle factors and how they work with training stressors is from the great coach Charlie Francis, a sprint coach in Canada, most notably Ben Johnson's coach. And Charlie likened the nervous system to a cup. And every stress imposed on the body, whether a training stress or a life stress, is going to fill that cup up to a varying degree. So if you have a part of the year where, you know, you have finals in school and you got in an argument with your girlfriend and then you're not sleeping as much and your diet's not on point, you're, you're incurring a ton of stress from lifestyle factors and that's going to leave less room in the cup for the training stressors to fill it up. So all those things need to be accounted for. Uh, so make sure that you're not just looking at the weight room with your athletes, but really considering everything they have going on in, in their life if you wanna have the most optimal programming possible. Training age and proximity to the career peak also needs to be considered when looking at intra-individual differences. As athletes improve and they train longer and longer, you know, they're going to have a higher special work capacity, but at the same time, they're also going to have a greater ability to stress their system. And that's something we'll talk about a little bit more. But consider when looking at, you know, different phases of an athlete's career and their training age, uh, when you consider the intra-individual differences, is that a lot of times you're going to be able through YouTube and Instagram and things like that to see the training of very high-level athletes. 
please, please consider when you're, when you're seeing that, that you don't just think about the training that they're currently doing, but you're thinking about the training that they did to get there. Uh, I've used this example before with Andre Milanichev and Ilya Ilyin, athletes who do highly, highly specific programs. Those highly specific programs are working for them because they are at the peak of their career. But it's not necessarily the thing that they did to get there, where they're generally doing more varied, you know, higher volume training, less specific exercise selection. So make sure when you're looking at the training of high level athletes, consider not just what they're doing at the time, but also what they did to get there. Now we want to look at these five different factors that are really going to dictate individual differences in training program design. First off, MRV, maximum recoverable volume, something we've talked about at length, particularly in our fatigue management video, if you want to go check that out. It's how much training can the athlete effectively recover from? As I mentioned before, as an athlete you know, trains longer and longer, their special work capacity is going to increase. They're going to be able to do more work than they did before, just because they're in better shape to do it. You know, if you've ever seen someone who works like a manual laborer, job and you know, maybe your maybe your grandpa is a mechanic and he's been turning wrenches you know day after day after day for decades on decades on decades well he can do that all the time and even though you might be younger than him and stronger in the weight room your hands get tired in five minutes well he can do it for eight hours straight that's a great practical example of special work capacity and a reason that an athlete uh, an athlete who's been lifting longer is going to be able to tolerate more training they're going to have an, a higher mrv than an athlete who's only been training maybe a year or two but you also need to consider the athlete's fiber type and sport background so as we mentioned fast twitch athletes who are probably better power lifters are not going to be able to have as relatively high an MRV. They're not going to need to do as much training as an athlete with slower twitch fiber. And something important to look at there is the athlete's sport background. If you have someone coming from maybe triathlons or marathon running into uh, powerlifting, that athlete is very likely more slow twitch dominant and they're going to have tremendous work capacity built up from their previous sport because those kind of sports just require a ton of training compared to someone who maybe was a sprinter previously they're more likely going to be a great powerlifter uh, compared to the marathon runner but because they're so much more fast twitch dominant they're not going to be able to have as high an mrv because all the training that they do is going to be that much more uh, you know taxing and stimulating to their to their body so we'll get fatigue and fitness decay times. So this is how quickly can an athlete decay their fatigue between training sessions and how long can they hold on to their fitness in, uh, with periods of lack of training. And this, this idea is going to go a long way to finding an athlete's optimal training frequency. Also, if you want to go more in depth on this type of idea, check out our video on the principle of SRA, stimulus recovery adaptation. So bigger, stronger, more experienced athletes, they have the ability to fatigue themselves more. Heavier weights are more fatiguing. They're more technically proficient, so they're operating at, at near their, their ultimate capacity. Um, with that ability to create more fatigue from their training, that, that fatigue is going to take longer to decay. Again, uh, fatigue decay times are largely genetic. Uh, also, lifestyle factors need to be considered, but you know, all things being equal there, the athlete who can produce more fatigue is going to take longer to decay that fatigue. So they're probably not going to be able to have as frequent of overloading training sessions. And that's a good thing because the bigger, stronger, more experienced athlete is also going to be able to hold on to their fitness longer. More muscle mass, more testosterone is going to cause slower fitness decay times for the athlete. So they're not going to need to train as frequently because they can't train as frequently due to higher levels of fatigue being induced from each training session. So we move on to development status and goals of the athlete. Here you need to look at what does the athlete need to be successful? Beginner lifters, intermediate lifters, advanced lifters, they're going to have different needs. In general, one of those biggest differences is going to be that beginner lifters lack the muscle mass of intermediate lifters who lack the muscle mass of advanced lifters. So they need, need to dedicate more of their time to hypertrophy training, while intermediate lifters are gonna have longer general strength phases, and advanced lifters, uh, especially when, if they're not trying to move up a weight class or anything, are gonna need to have longer peaking phases. Look at the athlete, what are they lacking? 
What muscle groups are they lacking? What's holding their lifts back? That is what you want to consider, you know, in, in the realm of individual differences in, in how you're selecting exercises and in different phase length structure. And we go more in depth on the idea of phasic structure in our video on phase potentiation. These four factors are great to consider when looking at individual differences of, of athletes. Size of the lifter, strength of the lifter, gender and proximity to career peak. The bigger a lifter is, the more fatigue that they're gonna take on, and usually the slower that fatigue is gonna dissipate. So let's, let's look at Thor Bjornsson, six foot nine, versus Sergei Fedosienko, you know, multiple time IPF world champion. Let's call him, and we might be being generous here, four foot nine. So Thor is pulling conventional, six foot nine, 400 pounds, Fedosienko, four foot nine, 59 kilos, 130 pounds, pulling sumo. Fedosienko's bar is moving about that far, you know, maybe three or four inches range of motion compared to when Thor Bjornsson pulls, you know, a thousand pounds at the World Deadlift Championships, he's six foot nine. The bar might be moving, you know, full of Fedosienko's height. He might be moving the bar that far. That means that the taller lifter is doing more work. All right, that's distance is a big part of work. The weight has to be considered and the distance that's being moved. So an uh, athlete with really long arms in the bench press, you know, very tall athletes, that has to be considered when determining, um, you know, SRA, training frequency, and, and considering how much fatigue the athlete is producing in each training session. Uh, also heavier lifters, you know, tend to have more muscle mass. That more muscle mass, it means more muscle to damage during a training session and more damaged muscle is gonna take longer to recover. Let's consider the strength of the lifter. The more weight that is on the bar, the more fatigue is going to be generated. You know, we could get into the idea of, well, if a 165 athlete is pulling 500 pounds, is that more fatigue generating than a 242 athlete pulling 600 pounds? As it's probably, you know, a better lift by Wilkes. Yes, that argument is probably worth being made, but for the purposes of this video and, and painting in broad strokes, the more weight that's on the bar, the more fatigue is gonna be generated. Gender differences. Men tend to be more fast twitch dominant, or you find more men who are more fast twitch dominant than you do females, and of course, higher testosterone levels. Both of those things need to be considered when designing training, because the more fast twitch dominance means that you know, they're producing more fatigue with every, every training session and have slower fatigue decay times because those fast twitch fibers take longer to recover, compared to slow twitch fibers, as well as more testosterone, meaning that they'll hold on to their fitness longer. So female lifters need to train, can and should train more frequently than their male counterparts. Finally, proximity to career peak. We've talked about that a little bit already. The more advanced a lifter becomes, the more ability they have to generate large amounts of fatigue from their training. So they're not gonna be able to train as frequently and they'll reach their MRV in fewer sets. You know, now that I squat, you know, 800, 900 pounds compared to, you know, maybe 10 years ago when I was squatting 500 pounds, I don't need to do as many sets to reach my maximum recoverable volume. Next, exercise selection. As an athlete advances throughout their career, they get closer to their career peak. They need to become more and more specific in their training. Beginner athletes want a much more broad training base to develop good general qualities. Uh, as you look at an athlete like Ilya Ilyin, Andrei Milanich have great simple examples of this. As they move up the pyramid of strength, they increase qualification. That pyramid is becoming more and more focused. I have an article by the same title. I'd suggest you go check that out to go more in depth on that topic. Finally, exercise technique. Different bodies use different techniques are gonna emphasize different muscles. A long femurred squatter, who's probably squatting more in a more bent over position, they're gonna need more work directed to their back. A more short femur who's able to stay more upright, more work directed to their quads. One of the best lifters in the world, Blaine Sumner, IPF world record holder in, in multiply, over a 900 pound squat raw, has probably the mo one of the most textbook low bar squats that you could imagine. An extremely back dominant squatter. And I know for Blaine, he's used the good morning 
very, very effectively in the development of his squat, doing like 585 up to maybe 655 for multiple sets of five and six reps. Myself, able to squat much more upright. The good morning has almost no carryover to my squat. I couldn't tell you if, I don't think I've ever done a good morning with more than 315 pounds. So those different types of techniques need to be considered. Close grip benchers compared to wide grip benchers. Do they need more development of the pecs or the triceps? Look at the exercise technique that the lifter is using. See what muscles drive those lifts. See what muscles need to be brought up so the lifts can, can be continually increasing. So that is our final principle, individual differences. Make sure you go back through this whole series. Specificity, overload, fatigue management, variation, principle of SRA, phase potentiation, and now finally this video. I think that these videos in combination with the book Scientific Principles of Strength Training by Dr. Mike Isertel, Dr. James Hoffman, and myself is going to really equip you guys to design effective programs for yourself, for your athletes, for your entire career. So hopefully you enjoyed the videos. Please subscribe to the channel.